Thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense. On today's show, we're talking about constellations connected to Christ. We're going to be looking at some Hebrew for signs and light and lights, all these different things. We're going to be going into Psalm 19, Job 9, Job 38. We're even going to look at how the gospel might have been written in the stars. The proto evangelion does it have a message? And is the Zodiac a perversion of that message? All of this and more is packed into the next hour. So thanks for tuning in. Let's get into it. Welcome back to another episode of Cross Defense. I'm your host, the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California. And I got to say, our inbox is filling up here at the Wing Lion Studio, my friends. It is filling up, including a thank you message and a blessing. A thank you and a blessing from Kelsey regarding her Sunday school question and our answer of that question here on the show. You're very, very welcome, Kelsey. Thank you for listening and for writing back. We have a lot to talk about today, so we're going to actually put a little bit of a hold on the email messages so we can get right into today's topic. Okay, so in the gospel reading for the second Sunday in Advent, according to the historic one-year lectionary, Jesus directs our attention to the sun, moon, and stars, saying, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Luke 21, 25 to 28. Now, as Christians, we don't spend a lot of time looking up into the heavens for wisdom. There are, of course, Christian astronomers, that is, Christians whose jobs are in the field of astronomy, and their work blesses mankind with knowledge and understanding. But what I mean is, Christians, we know that the source of truth doesn't come from reading the stars, doesn't come from astrology and seeing these signs in the heavens that then uh, endow upon us certain characteristics or what's your sign, right? Oh, I'm an Aquarius and I'm a, I'm a Capricorn. All that. We, no, we don't look for wisdom like that. We're not astrology people. We appreciate astronomy for what it is. But we know the stars are part, part of God's general revelation to all mankind, part of creation. So we can look at it for a general understanding of what kind of God we have, that there is a God, that there is a creator, and that he is an amazing author of all life, of all creation, who's worked out every little detail on the grand scale and on the micro scale, every little detail and put many different things in place to bless other aspects of his creation and serve his purpose, namely to serve us, the pinnacle of, of his creation, to bring us wisdom, truth about him, that all praise and glory would be to God. But Christians don't look up into the heavens for this wisdom. We don't look up into the heavens to search out, to read the stars for wisdom. We know that God has revealed specifics, not in his general revelation, but in his special revelation. And for that, we don't look up, but actually we look down. We look down into the scriptures, into God's preserved word, what we call the Holy Bible. We open it up and we look down into it as we study it and read it. Now, the disciples had a moment. They had a, a brief moment when, the, when they were indeed stuck looking up into the sky. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about in the book of Acts, right after the ascension. And the two men 
clothed in white robes, come, and the angels, and they tell, tell the, the disciples in Acts 1, 10, and 11, while they're gazing up into heaven, as Jesus ascends out of their view into the clouds, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Luke recorded that little episode at the end of Christ's time on earth. Matthew, Matthew in his gospel preserved something equally noteworthy at the beginning of our Lord's incarnation. In chapter 2, when the star following Magi come to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And what did Herod do when he heard this? He assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people Israel, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Did Israel's wise men look up into the heavens as the eastern sages did? For their wisdom? No, no, they didn't do that at all, looking for wisdom. Matthew 2, 5 to 6 says, They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, that's where the promised one will be born. That's where the Christ, the Messiah, will be born. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. God's wise men, truly wise men, cited Micah 5.2. God's people read the scriptures for wisdom. We look down into the Bible, onto the, onto the page, into the Word. So we don't spend a lot of time looking for wisdom in the stars. Why bother? We have the completed, revealed word of God specifically lining out for us what we need to know. Now the Magi, they looked to the stars and they ended up in the wrong place. (laughs) Do you ever notice that? They ended up in the wrong place taking what they saw in the sky, in the heavens, and interpreting it according to fallen human reason, they concluded that the king of the Jews would be in, where where else? Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. And they did indeed find a human king there in the palace, didn't they? What was his name? Herod. But it took special revelation, the direct communication of God's word in scripture to get them, the Magi, to Jesus. It took Micah 5, 2. It took the scribes reading the Bible and conveying that to Herod, to an audience, to get the Magi to the right place. Not to a palace, but to a stall, the manger, right? Absolutely. There, there they find, by following scripture, not a star, they find Jesus, our true king. And then again, again, it was God's special, not general, special revelation given to them in a dream that superseded their faulty magisterial reason, warned them not to go back to Herod, but to go another way. So there's a lot of information about stars in Scripture. But we don't need to really look at the stars for wisdom because we have God's special revelation. And so we don't readily look at the information in the stars on a regular basis because we're too busy looking at the cross, as we should be. We're looking at Jesus. But what I want to do today is excite your imagination and see how all of this works together, that God's general revelation, it echoes truth. It echoes what we find in God's special revelation. When we look at the special revelation of God in Scripture, and we use that as we look at the stars in astronomy, not astrology, not in the perverted demonic way, but in the, the wholesome study of God's creation way, we see 
an echo of the evidence of God's creation and God's love for us. We see the gospel if we have eyes to see it. So we're going to look at the stars today. In our last episode, we uh, talked a little bit about how many of these ancient megalithic structures, pyramids and these sorts of things, Stonehenge, how many are oriented according to the stars. We were, we were using Graham Hancock's uh, ancient apocalypse as a springboard. And that's not to say, again, let me repeat, that we agree with everything Graham, Han- Graham Hancock is saying. No. We appreciate that the conversation is moving farther away from evolutionary thought. And there are people even outside the church who are thinking about the great deluge. We appreciate that. And now we're using that as a springboard to dive into scripture where we should always be going. And so, maybe you're familiar with things like the South American Incan temples. Temples of the sun and the moon. Mexico's pyramids of the sun. Or of course... Stonehenge, as I mentioned a minute ago, right? That's very popular and famous. And there's been great work done showing that it marks solar and lunar observations. There's so many more like this. It's strange, isn't it? That these ancient pyramids and pyramids and megaliths across a vast array of continents and cultures are all preoccupied with the stars. Is that strange? <laughs> Actually, not at all. Not when we have the scriptures. To what does Genesis 1, 14 to 19 say? And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God said, set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day day. So this is a very, uh, this is the very creation of the stars, the fourth day of creation. And this is part of the pre-Babel history shared by all of mankind. Because of this, we're not shocked to discover that humanity across time and space have been focused that we've been focused on what the sun, moon, and stars have to say. One of their purposes, after all, is to be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. There are some truly imagination-quickening specifics in the Hebrew of this text here in Genesis 1. For instance, the word for lights here on the fourth day, is different from the word translated light on the first day. When God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is the Hebrew word or, light. Now, down in verse 14, on the fourth day, we read of lights in English. But the Hebrew word here is ma'or, which literally means place of light, as in a light bearer, or think a lamp, a luminary. Now, why is this interesting, you ask? Well, most importantly, at least for today's show, is that this immediately speaks against the idea of sun, moon, and star worship. That is to say, Genesis 1 is very polemical against the ancient religions that worshiped the sun, moon, and stars, against creation worship. Genesis says these things are mere tools, tools, instruments, mere light-bearing equipment, nothing more 
than that. A giant flashlight in the sky for you. A tool. The sun, moon, and stars aren't the source of the light, but merely bearers of it. They are not deities to be worshipped, but are merely part of creation. See, man is not to serve the sun. We're not to serve the moon and the stars, but in fact, these things, these luminaries, these lamps were created by God, by the deity, to be of service to us. They serve us. Now, another exciting aspect of this Genesis pericope is the word signs. This is the word oath. We come across this word for sign again in Genesis 4.15 when Yahweh puts a mark on Cain. He put an oath on Cain, a sign on him. Same as he put in the heavens above on the fourth day of creation. This is the word for the rainbow, too, in Genesis 9, 12 to 13. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all the future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and that shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Sign, oath. This is extremely interesting. When we consider the interaction Jesus has with the Pharisees in the first four verses of Matthew 16, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. So you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Now we've shifted languages from Genesis to Matthew, we've gone from Hebrew to Greek. But thanks to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible used by Jesus and his disciples, we see that the Greek word used by Jesus in Matthew 16, Simeon, is what's used for oath in Genesis. <laughs> Whether we're talking about the sun, moon, and stars, or the rainbow, or colors of the evening and morning sky, or a sign put upon Cain. All of these are the same sort of thing. They all, as Luther says in his commentary on Genesis 1.14, are the same as something unbelievable, something momentous or miraculous, by which God indicates to the world either his wrath or some sort of misfortune. And they are to serve us as signs either of wrath, or of favor. We're going to take a break right there. We'll be back. We'll talk more about these signs. Don't go away. You're listening to Cross Defense. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple, and faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Okay, so understanding that oath, Simeon, signs, these signs, whether they be sun, moon, and stars, or uh, upon Cain, or a rainbow, or the red skies in the evening and morning, these kind of signs, they can be very natural type, ordinary things, or they can be momentous, miraculous, unbelievable. Understanding this use of sign opens up for us a little more understanding of why it is that Jesus says an adulterous generation seeks for a sign adulterous. 
curious word, yeah? Our Lord and God, our bridegroom, has already shown us who he is. He has already given us plenty of signs that he is the creator of the world. He has already given us signs by which he has marked out his lordship. To say we can read those signs, different types of skies, as in the case of Matthew 16, and at the same time test our bridegroom and ask for a sign of his lordship, that is to reveal that our hearts have strayed from our beloved, that we have strayed to another, that we have been influenced by another, adulterous. And throughout the Old Testament, we see the connection between adultery and idolatry. They are so close to each other. So the sin of idolatry is often connected with the sin of adultery. So we understand that it is a sin against our bridegroom. Christ Jesus. For this heart, the sign of Jonah is the only sign. The death and resurrection of our Lord, his three-day entombment in the belly of the earth to win our hand in marriage or to win it back, to cleanse our adulterous hearts. This is the only sign we need. Now, there's a lot going on with Jonah as the sign in relation to sun, moon, and stars and, and all of this conversation. See, Jonah was swallowed, and then he rose from his grave in the belly of the fish. And then what did he go on to do? Jonah 3.3. 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, Three days journey in breadth, exceedingly great. Now, remember from last episode, the Migdal of Babel, remember? Migdal is the Hebrew word for fortress, derived from the word gadol, which means what? To grow higher, taller, larger, greater, great, right? Now, here is the root again. Nineveh was a gadol city. A great city. Now, interestingly enough, the word for exceedingly here in the English is actually Elohim. <laughs> That's God. The word for God, the almighty creator. A great city of God is sometimes how this verse can be rendered. In Jonah 1-2, Yahweh says that the evil of the great city has come up before me. The Gadol city has a lod. It has come up. The brain's a buzz, right? <laughs> the scriptures are fascinating. They truly do excite the imagination. Now, even more so, when we remember from our discussion in the last episode that the Nineveh, Nineveh, not the Nineveh, but Nineveh was founded by whom? By Nimrod, that mighty man who rebelled, marauded, and led the people to rebel, to, to build the Migdal of Babel, remember? The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kalah, and Resen, between Nineveh and Kalah, that is, the great city, Genesis 10. 10 to 12. Now, we continue in Jonah 3, 4 with Jonah as he began to go into the city, going a day's journey into this city, and he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, what did the people of Nineveh do that the people of Babel didn't? They believed God. They trusted the word of God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Interesting, right? Interesting connections. So come back with me now to Jesus' response to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew 16. You want a sign from heaven? You know how to read signs in the heavens. You've already received one. I'm right in front of you. 
and, and yet you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Be like Nineveh and repent at the word of the resurrected prophet. Repent and live. <laughs> oh, so much going on here. I wish we had way more than just an hour, but alas, that's all we have. So we're kind of doing a flyby on all these things. Each one of these verses could take a lot more time just to kind of sink into, live in it for a little while, but we don't have that kind of time. So come back with me to the stars. They are oath, Simeon, signs put in place by our creator. And Jesus tells us to see them as such with our eyes informed by scripture. When we look at the sun, moon, and stars, and see the end approaching. We are to straighten up and raise our heads, for our redemption draws near. The parallel passage of Luke 21, 25 to 36, is Matthew 24, 29. Flip there with me. This gets us started. Here, Jesus is, is more specific about the behavior of the sun, moon, and stars as these verses continue. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, he says. Now, in my sermon here at St. Mark, on the second Sunday in Advent, a couple Sundays ago, I told them about Luther's approach to this text in his sermon 500 years ago. <laughs> He was contending, I made the correlation between scientism today and Aristotle. Luther was contending against Aristotle's influence on the world. Aristotle taught that the movement and the behavior of the sun, moon, and stars weren't signs. No, 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 no. But simply just natural phenomena. Explainable things. And he's not wrong. They are natural phenomena. They are explainable. We can learn a lot about them. This is what astronomers do. But Luther says just because they follow the law that God established for them, that doesn't mean eclipses and things like these are not still signs. They are still out of the ordinary for these created things, right? In fact, they are the exact opposite. An eclipse, the darkening of the sun or the moon, is the exact opposite of what these luminaries, these lamps, are supposed to do. So, yes, they're established and they are natural phenomena, but they are not the ordinary behavior of these instruments of God. These created things are ma'or. They are light bearers. It should get everyone's attention, everyone's attention, when these lamps stop giving off light, right? It should recalibrate our focus every single time, turning us back to the Creator, Elohim, to the Almighty God who made these luminaries. What's God up to up there? Why is the sun not shining right now? Why is the moon darkened? Why do I see stars falling from the heavens? They're supposed to stay up there. Why are they falling? We should straighten up when we see these. And as Christians know, what's coming? Our redemption, the kingdom of heaven is coming. Creation, earth, it will pass away, as the Lord says in our gospel reading for the second Sunday in Advent. The heavens, the sun, moon, and stars, and the earth, where all this distress is, they will pass away, but my word will not ever pass away, he says. It will endure forever, which is where we get the, the VDMA, right? Verbum Domini Mana in Eternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. The great Reformation uh, motto or mantra. The word of the Lord endures forever. These things, seeing Stars falling out of the sky are supposed to help us remember the Creator is enduring, not this fallen creation. It's coming undone. Now, we've lost this today, haven't we? In a continuation of that Aristotelian thought, 
Aristotle's influence on the world that Luther was contending against. We've lost it. We're still stuck in that scientism of the day. We don't understand nature in a way that draws us closer to God, but in fact, mainstream science, including astronomy, and all the false religions, including the astrological astrology, are actually attempts to reject God's existence. For the exact same reason men reject the word of God, brought to them by Christ evangelists, they reject the heavenly stars as signs of the Creator. Creation became, in Satan's mythologies, the Creator itself. As St. Augustine says, and I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect that God dwells in the righteous evangelists to set forth the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, just as we see that in the heavens a glorious dwelling place of God exists. People don't want to receive the message of God. They, they don't want to know that there is a God because that means they're not their own God. That means they don't need a Savior, Jesus Christ, to come and win them back. They don't need the bridegroom, the sign of Jonah. They don't need his resurrection because they're their own gods. And so we see in human history the lying serpent of old perverting the good of the fourth day of creation. Creation has become, became long ago in Satan's mythologies, the creator. The luminaries became the lords. The sun became the chief god. And the moon and stars, which includes the ancient, in the ancient mind, the planets, they saw them as stars, became lesser deities in their pantheons. We, we get this polytheism and pantheism and all this kind of stuff. And, and we have, then, these ancient structures built to track the sun, moon, and stars for the purpose of serving them as gods. Not for the purpose of, of, of having the stars and the sun and the moon serve man, but so that man could serve these false deities. And while they are remarkable historical artifacts, these megaliths, these, these pyramids, these stone hinges and things like this, they are also, they are also sad, sad monuments of idolatry that trace sin all the way back to the Tower of Babel and into Noah's pre-flood civilization. Now, last week we looked at what Josephus said about the Tower of Babel. I want to take us again to Josephus. We're going to go to Psalm 19 in a minute, so if you want to get there right now while I'm about to read to you, Josephus, go ahead and do that. But I really want to take a look here at what this first century Jewish historian had to say about the invention of astronomy, because it's, it's exciting for the imagination to think about today. Toward the end of chapter 2, of Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, he says, as he's discussing the generations of Adam and uh, all the way down to the, the death of the patriarchs, those long-living men of the pre-flood era, it's remarkable how long they lived and how much, how great they were. Luther goes on and on about these guys. It's wonderful. Uh, but Josephus brings us to Seth, Adam's son after Cain killed Abel. And I want us to notice what he says. This is fascinating if you've never read this. Now, this Seth, Josephus says, when he was brought up and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man. And as he was himself of an excellent character, so did he leave children behind him who imitated his virtues. Ah, this goes with our parenting episodes not long ago, right? Christian parents, raising Christian children to be Christian parents, remember? That's the solution to our society's problems. All these, Josephus says, proved to be of good dispositions, all Seth's children. They also inhabited the same country without dissensions and in a happy condition, no wars, without any misfortunes falling upon them till they died. Now get this, they also were the inventors of that peculiar set of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order. 
and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water. They made two pillars. Now, that's fascinating, right? You think about Peter and his warning that, like in the, at the flood, there will be coming this, this uh, deluge of fire, right? That's, that's what we're looking forward to next. The next time the world is destroyed and remade, it will be by fire, and that's going to come at the end of time when the sun returns in judgment. The one pillar was of brick and the other was of stone. They inscribed in their discoveries on, both, on them both that in the case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain, and vice versa, and exhibit those discoveries to mankind, and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now this remains in the land of Syria to this day. Okay, so very interesting stuff here that Josephus records for us, that the patriarchs, who were virtuous men, invented the, the study of astronomy, the, the, the science, the, the peculiar sort of wisdom of astronomy. Fascinating stuff. Let's take a break right there. We'll be back and we'll continue our conversation on constellations and Christ and, and on the stars and how we learn about the stars from Scripture. We'll be right back. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. What's so fascinating about the, uh, the patriarchs, the, the primeval patriarchs, the pre-flood patriarchs, uh, the thought of them invent- inventing astronomy, what's so fascinating about that? Well, re- remember, I want to emphasize this again like I did in the last episode. This is part of history. Genesis 1 to 11 is human history that's shared by mankind before we were dispersed over the face of the earth with different languages. This is when we were still all one language and, and mankind was a lot tighter. It's our universal history here. And so we're going to find some commonality across all cultures. This is pre-Babel history. Now, why is that important for today's topic? Because it helps us understand why it is that the 12 constellations that we typically refer to as the Zodiac are universally recognized by all cultures throughout the world and throughout time, seemingly since the dawn of creation, at least, at least since the dawn of our post-flood era. So since Seth's children, at least. As we will find out in Job, we have scriptural reason to believe, and so we do, that God made them. Perhaps Seth's children named them, just as granddad Adam named the animals. Maybe there's a connection there. Excites the imagination to think so. We'll come back to the Zodiac in just a minute. But first, are you still in Psalm 19? Good. Let's take a look at that. In the first six verses, David refers to the general revelation of creation. The word he uses in Psalm 19, in the first six verses, for God is El. When he gets to verse 7, then the psalm shifts. Then David shifts to the specific name of God, Yahweh, as he shifts to the special revelation of the Torah, the law. So what we have here is Elohim, right? The, The almighty creator God that all mankind should be able to find and know by looking at creation. And then David takes us to, oh, and by the way, his name is Yahweh. You can know him personally the specific revelation, okay? So the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19 says, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, 
This is what the fourth day of creation is all about, isn't it? Day to day, verse 2, pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, this is the ESV version, okay? But other translations have a more literal rendering of the Hebrew. The New American Standard, for instance, puts the Hebrew this way. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. Their line. The sun, moon, and stars don't have a voice that can be heard. But their words, their words, their message reaches the end of the world. I, I particularly prefer not glossing the Hebrew word for line here into voice. It's a measuring line. Now, voice works. It conveys the ultimate point. Absolutely. The stars convey a message to the whole world, but one that is not spoken by words. Could it be that we have here the measuring line of the 12 constellations, which the whole world knows, and that utter the glory of God? Fascinating stuff for the imagination. Now, verse 4 continues. In them, he has set a tent for the sun. Now, let's not blaze past this little gem. In them, he has set a tent for the sun. What do we know about the 12 constellations in relation to the sun? They're on the sun's path, aren't they? It's called the ecliptic, as in eclipse, right? The ecliptic. The sun follows its God-ordained path through these 12 constellations each year as the Earth's seasons change. And this is known as the zodiac, which is from the Greek, zodiakos kuklos, circle of animals. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Don't tell me theology is boring. If you haven't studied the word, it is exciting. Your imagination just starts bubbling with enthusiasm and excitement. Tell me more. I want to know more. I only have an hour. I can't go into too much more detail. <laughs> but I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. I understand that feeling. It's so exciting. You just want to spend every waking moment peeling through each individual word of Scripture, reading it, marking it, inwardly digesting it, seeing Christ in every lat, last dot and tittle, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Verse 4 continues. No, no, verse 5 tells us the sun comes out, as Psalm 19 continues. The sun comes out like a bridegroom, think Christ, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man, think the strong man of Satan, and the stronger man binds him. Maybe there's a correlation there with the binding of Orion? I don't know. Maybe. Excites the imagination. But I do know the reality that Scripture says that Jesus is a stronger man and he does bind Satan. So we always bring it back to Scripture. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. I hope you're looking at the text with me, Psalm 19. We're going into verse 6 right now. It's rising. The sun's rising. It's from the end of the heavens. And its circuit, circle, right? to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Mm. Now consider this observation from Henry Morris. You know Henry Morris, Institute for Creation Research? I know, um, you know, back in the day, I was really interested in Answers in Genesis and ICR, Institute for Creation Research. I think more emphasis is giving toward Answers is given toward Answers in Genesis these days, but ICR is still great stuff. Henry Morris gives us some wonderful information. Now consider this. He was uh, the president for ICR. He says, for at least the first third of human history, that's going to depend on 
on your datings exactly, but if we're speaking in broad enough terms, it, it works. From Adam to Abraham, the only written scripture available to mankind were the brief records of the primeval patriarchs now preserved for us by Moses as the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Except for the Jewish nation, to whose prophets were then revealed the rest of the Old Testament, the nations of the world had no written revelation throughout at least two-thirds of human history. What did they have? The voiceless text of the heavens, as David proclaims in Psalm 19, 1 to 6. Interesting observation Mr. Morris gives us. Add more excitement to your sanctified imaginations, my friends. Consider Job. Job lived before Moses. That means he lived before the first 11 chapters of Genesis were written down. So what do we find in Job? Well, in verse 9, 6 to 9, Job proclaims that God is maker of the constellations, Mazaroth. He says of God that he commands the sun and it does not rise. He is he is who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea, who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Now, Eric A. von Fange, in the great CPH book, In Search of the Genesis World, Debunking the Evolution Myth, points out that ancient people divided the skies into three categories, non-setting stars, rising and setting stars, and the stars hidden under the horizon in the south. Hmm. Job 9.9 9 mentions all three types, the bear or Aish in Hebrew, Arcturus in Greek, or as we like to say in America, the Big Dipper. <laughs> so lame. Uh, it's a non-setting star. No, the, this constellation is non-setting in Job's latitude. Orion, Hesperus, or Kessel in Hebrew, and the Pleiades, Kima in the Hebrew, are both rising and setting groups of stars. And then he mentions the chambers of the south, hidden under the horizon. But that's not the only goodness coming from Job. Turn to chapter 38, Job 38, 31 to 33. Come with me here. This is also fascinating stuff from our 30,000 foot view, as we're all dying to just to spend a little more time in one little section of it. You there? Okay. Job 38, 31 to 33. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Mazaroth, says Morris, literally means constellations. God leads forth the constellations in their season. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, he does. As we see that he has pitched the tent for the sun in Psalm 19, right? Now, I said last time, I got to contain my excitement here. It's awesome. I, I said last time that we would, we would talk about how this voiceless text may express the gospel promise of Genesis 3.15. Remember? And how then we might expect to see that the heavens were the first text, so to speak, first text with a written in a line, measuring line. Again, see how I prefer that one? First written text. Satan twisted, giving birth to astrology, which is how we think, typically think of the zodiac, isn't it? You think of you think of the reading of the stars to tell your fortune. This is a twisting of astronomy. It's also uh, plays its part in pantheism, polytheism, animism, spiritism. I mean, name name the ism, and the Lord, the Lord's good word can be found there. It's twisted and perverted, right? It's twisted and perverted. This is what Satan does with the Bible. It's what Satan does with all of creation. It's what Satan has done with the stars. He has taken astronomy and perverted it. 
He's taken reading the stars to know seasons and days, but also to see signs, as our Lord says in Luke 21, as we hear in Matthew 24, signs to straighten up and get ready for our redemption drawing near. He takes that and he perverts it. So every false religion birthed by the demons forces us to see God's creation in a perverted way. Okay, so this is what Henry Morris presents as a thought. Nothing more than a thought. It may be that the signs placed by God in the heavens and perhaps named and studied by Seth's patriarchal progeny, if Josephus is, is accurate, declare God's glory, as Psalm 19 tells us, that these were originally intended as a great visual aid, a written text to all the peoples of the world, supplementing the, the proto-evangelion, the promise of Genesis 3.15, of the coming Redeemer through the seed of the woman, who would finally do what? Crush the serpent's head. Such a message would survive, Morris points out, when the, the earth was devastated by the great flood, right? And it would survive the confusion of the languages at Babel because it was written in the heavens before we had text written down in the scriptures. I want to emphasize this for this creation scientist. He definitely says what he's about to say about the, the 12 constellations very appropriately, only after stating that the stars don't mean anything for us. It doesn't matter. He says, we have the complete word of God inscripturated, providing absolutely all the guidance we need for faith and life today, which brings us full circle, right? As we started the show, as God's people, we don't look up into the heavens for our wisdom. No, we look down into the book of the Bible, just like the scribes did for Herod when they cited Micah. When the Magi showed up, who did look to the stars for their wisdom, and they ended up in the wrong place, and then Herod said, hey guys, you Israelite scribes, where's the Messiah supposed to come from? I'm like, oh yeah, well the scripture says this. That's what we do. That's what we do. So keep that in mind as I'm front-loading this giant caution. Even the guy who proposes how to, to look at the constellations as if they are proclaiming Genesis 3.15, the first gospel promise, he also says they don't mean much for us now or anything at all because we have the Bible we look at. So Morris's imagination exciting thought is that the 12 signs of the Zodiac, the 12 constellations that were perverted by Satan into astrology, actually proclaimed the gospel. One, Virgo, the virgin, promised seed of the woman. Two, Libra, the balances, scales of divine justice. Three, Scorpio, the scorpion, sting to be inflicted upon the promised seed. Four, Sagittarius, the archer, corruption of the human race through demonism. Five, Capricorn, the goatfish, utter wickedness of mankind. Six, Aquarius, the water pourer, destruction of the primeval world by water, the flood. Seven, Pisces, the fishes, emergence of the true people of God. Eight, Aries, the ram, sacrifice of an innocent substitute for sins. Nine, Taurus, the bull, resurrection of the slain ram as the mighty bull. Ten, Gemini, the twins, the dual nature of the reigning king. Eleven, Cancer, the crab, ingathering of the redeemed from all ages. And twelve, Leo, the lion, destruction of the fleeing serpent by the great king. This is Morris's thought nothing more than a thought on what perhaps the stars and the constellations that have been around that God made were originally meant for as far as their unbelievable sign beyond their, their uses, tools for navigation and light and the marking of the seasons and the days and these sorts of things. So what do you think? Interesting stuff. I know we had to breeze past a lot of stuff going on here. We're going to look at some more. Don't worry. We'll come back around to it. It's a thought-provoking concept, all of it, and especially that last little bit. 
And uh, we've just started to scratch the surface. The Bible talks much more about sun, moon, and stars, as you know, I'm sure. But we're out of time, my friends. We're out of time. So Cross Defense will be back fittingly on January 7th, 2023. We're going to take a break for the Christmas season. And why is that fitting? Because we'll be back with Epiphany and the Magi who followed the star to Jerusalem. (laughs) See how we worked that out? Yeah. We'll talk more about that specific event in relation to all of these things. We'll spend a little more time with some more stars if that's what you want to hear about. And uh, until then, have a Merry Christmas, guys. A Merry Christmas. May the celebration of our Savior's birth bring you peace and joy. See you later. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at kfuo.org.